Just a couple of days ago, I witnessed a very unfortunate series of events that led to the rejection of a paper. So I prepared a rant on peer review, but then I realized this is a problem of scientists and not all of you may be very well aware what peer review actually is. So this is why I prepared two videos. The first one explaining the peer review process and the potential problems. And the second one is the rant about the peer review. So if you already know about peer review, you can skip the first one and immediately go to the second one. And in any case, just let me give you the grounds for this rant. This is a good paper, except yeah, this paper is kind of okay, weak except. This paper is not so great, but maybe after changes, weak reject. This paper is broken beyond all reason. REJECT! So why do we need peer review? Peer review is a mechanism that developed over many years and its aim is to ensure quality in publications. All scientists are prone to error. So it is in your best interest to have someone checking your work independently to prevent yourself from publishing erroneous studies. Imagine how a serious mistake in your own work could backfire. Once it is published, everybody will see it. So one could say it's a safety belt for scientists. And while I was reading that, I was already typing uh, the response and they had to publish it because I was right. For these reasons, many scientists only consider peer-reviewed work as a scientifically grounded observation. Therefore, peer review is part of many parts of science. I consider these three different kinds of peer review here in particular. Peer review at conferences, peer review in journals, and review of thesis work, like submitting your PhD thesis. We are happy that it works better than any competing method, but um, that doesn't mean that we, we think we are done. So how does the typical peer review in a conference work? So note what I'm describing here is mainly regarding conferences and computer science. The most frequent form of peer review is the one that you encounter in scientific conferences. This is typically also the first experience of reviews that scientists encounter in their career. So sometimes you publish on your master thesis and then this is the first kind of peer review that you encounter. Depending on the field, conferences may vary from very shallow feedback to a very elaborate competitive process. In any case, the review is performed on the time pressure with a fixed deadline. As all scientists are busy people, this constraint is not without any effect. Uh, also because I'm lazy, so you know. In some occasions, up to 30% of the reviews are submitted after the actual deadline. This is then often called an emergency review that is performed within 24 hours. Obviously such reviews are more prone to errors than a full review that may take weeks to complete. As a result, peer review is often perceived, in particular conference peer review, as a stochastic decision process. 
and you know nothing in in machine learning is exact there's of course different types of conference reviews in order to ensure clear and also critical remarks most conferences use a blinded review process in a so-called single blind review the identity of the reviewer is concealed such that negative feedback does not result in, let's say, acts of vengeance. Nonetheless, some authors try to re-identify their reviewers by the used language and terms, so they have a hunch who could be the reviewer. I can only advise against this, as it will only result in ungrounded accusations. Some often highly reputed conferences tie to reduce potential bias due to personal dislike even further. In these cases, a double-blind review is used. Here the authors remove their names and all information from the paper that would allow to identify them. Thus the reviewer also does not know whose work they're actually waiting and is unable to favor certain groups of personal liking over other authors. So peer review can be regarded as a random process. Reviewer decisions suffer from a certain amount of randomness. They may be affected by a certain wording in the paper or question the general idea. Therefore, a single reviewer is regarded as unreliable. Most conferences choose between two to four reviewers and consider their majority vote on the work under consideration. In top tier conferences, even this is not regarded as trustworthy. Here, a so-called meta-reviewer is introduced into the process. REJECT! The meta's task is to arbitrate situations in which the reviewers do not find consensus in the first round of reviews. In these cases, the meta can guide the discussion and help the reviewers to find an appropriate evaluation of the paper. REJECT! Unfortunately, like in the example in the beginning of this video, some metas regard themselves as some kind of infallible deity that grants wisdom to the rest of the world. As such, Typically, all meta decisions are also subject to control by a higher instance, such as the technical program chairs of the conference. Yet, this choice too bears the risk of introducing yet another factor of randomness. And you know, nothing in, in machine learning is exact. So for example, if six technical program chairs have to manually check more than 1,500 paper decisions. In order to reduce the randomness further, some scientists even suggested to use even more reviewers, like let's say 30 to 50. In these cases, obviously a full review would not be possible, but the feedback would merely be thumbs up or thumbs down. Obviously, this would yield much better statistics because the decisions are then based on the wisdom of the crowd, as we know from boosting theory. Yet, this was never implemented at a real conference, as the large number of decisions would most likely lead to a certain problem. Now, if you have to do so many decisions, then the reviewers will judge the papers merely on the titles or maybe even read the abstracts. But 
it's not likely that they will really go through, let's say, 50 or even 60 papers and read the entire submissions. So therefore, this was abandoned. Now, let's review this a bit. What are the pros and cons of conference reviews? Generally, conferences only apply a one-step or a two-step process. Hence, there is no chance of in-depth discussion with the reviewers. Even the most elaborate conference review processes suffer from this problem. Therefore, you should not get demotivated by negative or harsh reviews. A lot of the work is done by volunteers, there's time pressure involved, so also the reviews may have even errors. So also the reviewers, of course, make mistakes. So try to understand the reasons for the critique and use it to improve your work. Some conferences aim at high rejection rates as a measure to publish only the best papers. As the stakes are high, reviews can often become very harsh. Also, expectations on top-ranked conference papers are very high. Even though peer review, in particular on conferences, is a stochastic process, the better papers are more likely to survive the peer review process. Still, a reject is not necessarily a sign of poor work due to the mentioned random factors. There are numerous examples of good papers that were rejected at conferences in the first submission. For example, NNUNet that has just made it to Nature Methods has been rejected at Nikai. We also had very nice papers on deep action learning that now went to Nature Scientific Reports or also the Super Resolution Database. It's a benchmark and it has later been published in Transactions on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence. So why do we still publish in these journals then? Can't we do everything in conferences? Well, you see a significant disadvantage of journal publications is that the peer review typically takes much longer. One round of reviews may take between three to six months. Still submitting to journals is of high value as the peer review process is much more elaborate and focuses much more on in-depth arguments. In many journals, the discussion between the authors and the reviewers go back and forth several times. As a result, the reviewers also pay attention to the details of the submitted work. They know that their assessment will be presented to the authors and they get the chance to adjust the work and argumentation accordingly. So if their arguments are not elaborate enough, their critique will be very easy to counter. Hence, arguments like not good enough, not novel enough, are less likely to be used. Instead, the reviewers have to provide a list of prior work that already addresses the issue and was not covered by the authors and this needs to be presented by the reviewer. As the authors know that they have to argue with the reviewer, some authors have the tendency to discuss all the observations of the reviewer away. This, however, is not the purpose of peer review. Each round should improve the paper, so authors should not fall for common mistakes such as taking the critique personal. The reviewer is interested in making your paper better. So don't deem the reviewer as stupid. Reviewers are representative readers of your paper. Other persons reading your paper will probably have very similar thoughts. Therefore, if you have to provide a 
additional explanations to your reviewer, you want to add them to the paper as well. A discussion section is exactly the right place to do so, as other readers will have similar questions. Such a section can also be a kind of safety belt. If your paper goes viral and is broadly misunderstood in a general public, you can refer to the discussion section and show that you already had similar discussions with the reviewers and that this is a misinterpretation of your paper. So you can already put the safety belt into the paper, in particular if it is a foreseeable critique and misunderstanding. Obviously, you want to make sure that your argumentation is correct. Any errors will be spotted by the reviewer and you risk the rejection of your paper. Now, a reject at a journal means that you cannot submit it again unless you completely revert the paper. So if your paper gets rejected, you probably want to do that anyway. I recommend to try your chances also at high-ranking journals. A desk reject, that means a rejection without peer review, REJECT, will maximally take two weeks and it will give you the feeling that you tried at least to get into the high-ranking journals. Publishers such as Nature even have the instrument of a pre-submission inquiry. In this one, you only submit the abstract and this will be evaluated within one or two weeks. Given three to six months of peer review, that is just a very small amount of time. So should we still actually write PhD thesis? Can't we just make cumulative works? This is why I want to discuss shortly a third kind of review that I want to include in this video. And this is concerning the review of thesis works, such as doctoral thesis. Some supervisors request accepted peer-reviewed publications for the successful completion of their PhD. Also, many universities now have developed the instrument of cumulative works, which means that you submit instead of a thesis that is completely written from scratch, a set of peer-reviewed articles instead of the thesis. This procedure has quite a few problems. As the thesis is associated to a formal degree, cumulative works have to provide evidence that the set of submitted works is really mainly based on the contributions of the submitting person. So, therefore, authors are often required to ask their co-authors to sign off the use of a paper as a part of a cumulative thesis. In most cases, there is no abuse and the forms help to spot situations in which the same paper is attempted to be used for the graduation of two different persons. Still, the problem could arise that for someone who actually did not write the work on their own, they could try to obtain a degree using a long list of co-author contributions. As a result, some universities still require the writing of a formal thesis. The list of arguments for and against this is very long. Some consider it as a waste of resources. For others, it is the only means to demonstrate true academic ability. In any case, the resulting thesis will be subject to evaluation by independent reviewers. Obviously, they will assess the work to the best of their ability. To my experience, it helps to show that the work has resulted in high-ranking peer-reviewed work. This is either demonstrated by impact factor or citation count. Therefore, pursuing peer-reviewed publications during the scope of a PhD program is highly advisable. 